Welcome everyone to Straight Science. Straight Science is an evening science seminar series put on by UAF Northwest Campus here in Nome and UAF University of Alaska Fairbanks, UAF Alaska Sea Grant also here in Nome. And both Alaska Sea Grant and Northwest Campus, we are public servants of the Bering Strait region and we serve all peoples of the Bering Strait region which is the homeland and waters of the Inupiaq, Yupik, and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples. So tonight, uh, I'm very excited. We have one of Gnome's own and uh, Joy Baker, and we're going to talk about the port. And the port has been on an ongoing process, and I'm just so thankful that Joy is giving us an opportunity here tonight to learn more and ask our questions and things like that. So as an introduction, I... You know, I've known Joy, uh, and I, but I had to ask her when she started with the port, and I, I wrote it down. So 1990 is when Joy started with the city of Nome. I think she was 14 at the time. Is that right? Something like that. Close to it. Absolutely. But anyway, she yeah. has uh, seen 13 city managers come and go. And she started as the harbor master in 1997 and up until, and then port director a few years ago. And then this year, it looks like 2023 is going to be a handoff to the new harbor master, which we don't know who that is yet, but we will. And Joy will make that transition very nice for the new person. So we're in good hands uh, as it transitions. So with that, we're, we are all familiar with the topic of the port, but I think now we're getting down into the real formation of the port. And um, I'm excited, Joy, to learn more about what we should expect and what, the, what it's really going to be like. Um, so thank you again. With that, take it away. Thanks so much Ab for coming. Absolutely, Gay. Thanks for the invite. Um, not going to do anything very formal here. It's going to be pretty laid back, folks. If um, I, I would like to get through the slides before you ask questions, so maybe if you see a slide you got a question on, you can um, you can uh, sketch it down so that we can go back and capture that. Um, so we'll skip right into. <clears throat> a lot of you have seen if you've seen these. Uh, presentations before. I know Denise has seen this screen and so is, so is Charlie. You know, we are, um, we, the, the Port of Nome is the transshipment hub for the majority of the communities that you see on this map. Now, uh, you know, we, we call it Barrow to Platinum. Of course, we have to ship sand to Dutch Harbor, but that was once and quite a long time ago. But at one point or another, we have shipped all of these communities and some of them we ship to regularly. Uh, frequently there uh, with weather, we can actually receive the mainline barges for um, the Yukon for going up to um, Bethel as well as Kotzebue. So sometimes they run that freight through Nome just to be able to discharge their barges so they can take them back south for another load. Um, and at, in those hub services, you know, you can see here the many of those of you that live in Nome know this already, but the many of things that the Port of Nome supports are, uh, you know, project related transshipment of equipment and materials. Um, we've got uh, equipment coming in to go out and to the uh, to the mines for resource development, uh, construction, many um, schools, hospitals, and clinics in the villages are typically the, the equipment and materials routed through Nome and um, occasional search and rescue. And we do the resupply for the vessels that come through the region to do not only the projects and deliver the cargo and fuel, but the ones that come up and do scientific research. Uh, the tour ships, um, pretty much anything that's on the water at one time or another has got a reason to come by Nome, except for the LNG tankers right yet, and we're not, we're not quite ready for that anyway. That will be a while down the road. 
Hey, Joy, this is Gay. Um, is it possible for me? It looks like the the font is really small on your slides. Is there a way to hit that that little screen button <clears throat> on the lower right by your size adjuster just to get oh, that sure. to be bigger? Um, how about we? It just looks like a little uh, old slide screen. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Let me get it to full screen like I actually know what I'm doing no it's all good I just don't want don't want anyone to miss out on all the oh me neither no no let me let me uh you know I thought I had a button down here that would take me no nope. you do it looks like keep going to the right one more hook no I think that's it. no I don't think that's it yep one more I see that one that's not okay sorry folks just no well, we, it's minute. okay i asked so i'm I sorry will. to break it up but i was thinking it wasn't a just keep going well, like you were well let me get it up to current slide okay just double click on the slide you were on yeah i was <clears throat> And there should be, what the heck? Okay, now you've got me rattled. No, go, sorry, go to this, go to view. Sorry, everybody, go to view on the top That's bar. All right. And then just go. Um, Where's the full screen? Normal. It's let's say slideshow go. somewhere up there. Yep, that's fine. I can that's force this and I can force that. No, I don't force that. I can force that. How's that? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Keep it keep it going. Okay. So thank sorry you about that, folks. Yeah. No, that's I shouldn't have said so <clears throat> um we're looking at uh you know the first upgrade to the Port facility since uh, 2004, five, and six, where they relocated the entrance channel. Um, there have been many uh, pieces of legislation. You'll see here Water 2020, and we've had Water 21. This is Water Resources and Development Act, and you know, and um, we just recently had some National Defense Authorization language uh, things that continue to work in the city's favor our cost share just went from 6535 to 9010 um, in the last legislative year which that's huge for now um, the design agreement started on june of 16 we've just completed we're just about done with design and we're looking at a hundred percent coming in May 3rd, um, the project and purpose, and I'll get into the actual project itself here really shortly. Um, you know, we will become the only deep water port in the Arctic, US Arctic at minus 40 feet in the deep water basin. Right now we've got minus 22 and that is actually still considered the deepest, you know, um, port coastal facility in the region as most everybody else has either got eight foot at the dock or we're talking um, beach access. Um, well, we're still overcrowded. Most of you have seen, and you'll see some pictures in the slideshow of the congestion out there when we're trying to service all the vessels and activity that is occurring. Um, so we're, we're expanding to deeper water to capture the larger vessels as well as expand the docking facilities so that we we can service more vessels at once and actually service vessels on both sides of the harbor not even not just to extend the existing causeway but we will be removing the existing breakwater here on the right and re removing the stone from the water and rebuilding a causeway that'll have two docks on it. So we'll have um, the capacity to handle vessels on both sides. Um, 
the intent is to expand our capability to house um, oil spill response and search and rescue assets, as well as being able to resupply those vessels and have uh, staging for their equipment and for the oil spill response, as well as crew quarters for the search and rescue vessels. <clears throat> Okay, speaking of congestion, um, this, you can, this can, uh, any of these photos on any given day can occur with our exports of armor stone and crushed gravel for the region's construction projects each ice free season. Um, sometimes, as you can see here on the top left, we've got uh, significant um, loads of material crushed going out on two different docks. And on the dock behind the cameraman, there's a uh, there's a fuel barge. You can just see the edge of the fuel barge who's actually discharging. On um, the top right, you can see all the armor stone, which you've got a stage. In the bottom right, you can see all the containers. This is normal when we've got these kinds of vessels in and multiple operations happening at once. Um, it's going to be tight for construction uh, contractors to work through here to extend out to deep water. But we've had a couple of discussions with, uh, with some contractors through industry day and we will find a way to make that work so the port can operate as well as the contractors can get the work done without too many um, uh, delays. <clears throat> Here you've got just the types of ships that we resupply on a regular basis. Uh, cruise ships on the right, um, Coast Guard to cruise ship on the top left, and the NOAA ships on the bottom left. Um, these we and the one in the center, as you can see by the flag, these are the Canadian Coast Guard. Those are the first gray hulls we've seen, and. Uh, the Secretary of the Navy was not happy when he found out that we'd already seen gray holes, but they weren't any of his. Um, so he's going to have to wait and be second. But, you know, any of these vessels can come in at any time as and be mixed with a cargo vessel as well. So there could be fuel, we could be loading gravel. It, it's just a very busy operation that uh, warrants this project for the expansion purposes. <clears throat> okay, getting into the project here, this uh, little graphic here talks about how the project is laid out for the partnership. The Army Corps on the right, you'll see the general navigation features. Those are the breakwaters and the dredging that the Army Corps is responsible for. And then uh, below that, you'll see they work up that design package and then that becomes part of the contractor bid package that'll go out in August. The city has a cost share to that. And that we, therefore, we are partners, as you can see in this line with the core. As mentioned earlier, our cost share is now 10% of the cost to do the general navigation features. If you shift to the left side of the screen, the city of Nome has 100% responsibility of the local service facilities, which are the docks and the roads and the utilities. Um, we have our own design team working on our facilities. And uh, you see NJUS, they're managing our utilities contractor uh, design firm that is designing all the utilities for the local service facilities the city is building. And then we've got p and engineers that is responsible for the dock design and the roads, bridges, and any dolphins. So um, it's a pretty big group. And then under each uh, logo you see here is a team of its own. So, P&D and CRW, when that is, those designs are done, this LSF design package also feeds in to the contractor bid package and everything is put on the street and bid out at the same time. Okay, the Corps decided in late 21 
early 22 that we needed to break the project out into three phases to make it more manageable, both for um, contractor bidding mobilization as well as uh, federal and local funding. So we've got phase one here, which is all that the, the core and the city are concentrating on for this first construction year. <clears throat> It removes the little, what we call a spur off the end of the causeway and constructs the full extension, which is 3,500 feet. And we, the dock construction, and this right here that shows three individual docks, it's actually a full solid dock. And you'll see that in some of the renderings further in the presentation. So phase one will only affect the causeway and we'll push the, the causeway construction out to the deeper water contour of minus 40 feet. Phase two is basically the dredging, you know, bid and award uh, dredging for a contractor to come up and dig the existing outer harbor, which is minus 22 feet to minus 28 feet, and the new deep water basin to minus 40 feet. Phase three, this will do the removing of the existing breakwater, relocate this actually about 150 feet further east, and they will build the causeway. It'll become a causeway structure with a road, and it'll have two docks on it, and then they will dredge this new uh, portion of the existing outer harbor to minus 28 feet as well. <clears throat> but again, we're only doing phase one. That's all that the core and the city are working on right now. This gives you the picture I was just describing. This is the full dock design that we will be constructing. The core thought we wanted three separate docks. We decided that you know, actually putting in sheet pile makes a lot more sense versus having to build the armor stone on the slope out to support the structure. Uh, we could save a lot. It's actually cheaper to build the dock section than it is to build the armor stone slope um, in between the cells. <clears throat> As we talked about back in the organizational chart, the core here does the breakwaters and the dredging. The city do these docks, roads, bridges, and then as well as the all of the utilities as oversight, overseen by uh, the utilities. For those that aren't real familiar with the port, uh, I wanted to mark this up. This is the existing facility we have. And the whole rendering here will show you what it will ultimately be in year probably 28, could be 29. We got our fingers crossed though. <clears throat> now, obviously, you know, other, other benefits that we're confident that will be supported by the expansion is uh, the national security, environmental safety, economic and cultural sustainability and encouraging research and more resource development across you know, the whole Seward Peninsula and then tourism and recreation. Um, we see, again, vessels in these categories and have in recent years, um, but we're talking about being able to support them in a greater fashion with more capability for the docks, so deeper, deeper water and increased um, amenities and services on shore. <clears throat> so this is just another aspect of the national security and life safety expanded just a bit. Um, you know, this is obviously the Healy and once we have the deep water basin constructed, um, the Healy will be able to pull in as well as the Crystal Serenity and other large cruise ship vessels will be able to accommodate the um, Navy's Arleigh Burke destroyer, 
Um, there's talk about being able to accommodate the, uh, the submarine, but that, that's not really the target of the construction, but we are talking about being able to be being able to accommodate these larger military vessels so that they can resupply without going traveling all the way down to Dutch. Another element that will result as of the construction is what the Polar Code um, calls the Arctic Port Reception Facility. And they have established the ability to, you know, and, and the language actually stipulates, you know, that each port should be able to accept uh, ship waste. But due to the uh, remoteness of our region, they established an exception to allow for a regional port reception facility. And we have been raising our hands and waving the flag that we intend to be this region's port reception facility and be able to take these uh, waste materials, black water, gray water, um, and garbage, also um, contaminated oil to some degree, and uh, what they call um, regulated waste, which comes from the galleys of the foreign vessels. If we have the uh, incinerator structure built, we can then accept those materials and uh, properly incinerate them. <clears throat> Here's some of the resource development that I, I was talking about. I see Charlie's on the line, Charlie Lean. He's been a, an excellent um, help in guiding us in some of these prospects that remain and, and have the capability or at least still warrant you know, the interest to hopefully have developers come in and, re, and, and try to expand and increase our exports for some of these resources. <laughs> Obviously, everyone's aware of the graphite operation. We've been talking to them regularly, and we expect that uh, once they're ready to export, we can actually accommodate them now with the south, with, with the quantities that they anticipate being able to ship south, we can accommodate them with the capacity that is going south on the cargo liners as well as our ability to stage their materials. So as that continues to develop, we'll have more on that. But um, um, yeah, for now, we're just in a planning mode. <clears throat> Obviously, everyone's aware of the Cape. Cape Nome still has what we understand to be a 100-year estimate of the, of the life of the quarry in, in rock. They still anticipate being able to mine the same good quality uh, degradation of, of rock out of that pit that we've been doing up until now since the causeway was first built in 1985. <clears throat> um, for those of you that are into the economics, um, here's some numbers that we pulled from the feasibility study that we did with the core. Uh, that um, finished back in 15, 16, I think. Um, you know, and this is during construction. And when you see, you know, regional 818 jobs, what we're talking about is, you know, what, what the core economists were talking about is all the, uh, you know, the, the, the translating jobs that translate from Nome to the villages into the cities and the, the equipment that is being purchased by the contractors and all of their materials that they bring up, you know, it's it all it's like a the domino effect that all continues to transfer down line with um, manufacturers and suppliers and folks even across the nation for things that you don't get you aren't able to buy in Alaska, or at least sufficient quantities. <clears throat> and then there's post-construction jobs that obviously are, are, are much less, but you still see how they 
anticipate and that you know the core feasibility study is online you're more than welcome i can even give you the website for that you're more than welcome to look at the economics report and the appendix to determine you know look at the background and how they built this um happy to share that with anyone that's interested but you know it's 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 good to see and i and i think everyone understands that once the port well once the port expansion is in place you know there there's just there's no way to man it with the existing personnel whether it's the port or whether it's uh the restaurants or whether it's um fuel trucks for discharging for for loading the vessels um the fuel that we'll be handling in town to we'll be getting more in in order to um resupply the ships and refuel the ships that come in so i think everything is going to escalate and migrate upward gradually i don't think we're going to shoot straight up but I do believe that there's going to be growth, job growth, economic growth. Well, and and you know it's going to translate out to, into the region, which was one of the main purposes of the project is to give this region a good economic boost. Um, we're looking here at the design and construction schedule. Again, phase one is all we're talking about right now. <clears throat> We just turned in 95% design here at the end of February. It's being reviewed. Um, we'll get comments back from the division layer of the Army Corps District in Anchorage and handle those comments between the Corps and the city's designers, anticipate 100% in May of 23. And that is needed to facilitate getting the project fully compiled into a package and on the street to solicit contractors. They anticipate awarding in January of 24 and construction is to begin in May of 24 and they expect it to take four years. Now, you know, I can't tell you that the contractor is gonna be here full bore on, in May of 24 and start throwing rocks in the water. <clears throat> That's because there's a lot of moving parts and awarding in January, as you guys know, and getting orders put on the barges. Um, these guys got a lot of equipment and materials to procure and load up and bring to Nome, as well as rock to start making. So, you know, there are any number of combinations that can occur where the contractor can bring a small supply of rock to get started then work the rock in the region, you know, whichever quarry they happen to make a deal with. We'd all like to hope it's going to be Cape Nome and 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 yeah, I sure hope that it's that quarry versus a quarry outside. Um, so it's going to depend on who's awarded the work, how prepared they are, how long it's going to take them to get prepared and whether they're gonna spend that summer mining rock and hauling it or part of the summer and then get started putting rock in. You know, it, there's just a lot of variables. And when the contractor is awarded and starts making his plans, that's when we'll have a better idea of exactly what may start in 24. But I, you will see construction barges showing up in summer of 24, I'd say, May, June, July, at least bringing equipment up to get something done in the first season. And then they will be instructed to build an end abutment on the breakwater. Let me see if I can go back to, so I can explain what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, so, you know, say they get down to here, just past the Healy, and they've built out and they've started the dock, well, they're gonna to have to put in a closed cell to protect the open end of the dock as they shut down for winter. And the breakwater, the, the causeway will turn and become a breakwater 
with large stone built up from the floor to protect the open end. We come back the following season, they've got to remove the closed cell so they can continue building the dock. And then they will have to remove the rock off of the end, salvage the large stones. I doubt they're gonna bother with any of the bedding or smaller stones, but take the large stones off the edge, set them aside to use them for the next section that they will build in that next ice-free season. <clears throat> huh? Okay, oh, I guess I'm done. <laughs> I didn't know that, but um, well, and I can show you here, we've got some, you know, this shows you, we've already begun designing phase two. Again, we're in partnership with the Corps. We've given them our cost share for the design funds. Again, that has also shifted to 9010, as will phase three. So we're working on design there, they've got, a uh, team out there that's coming out after I did a ride to do some geotech work and within the footprint of the expansion and to bring back, you know, information about the geological conditions out there and um, so they don't have any surprises or the contractor doesn't. And then they're still thinking, the core thinks we won't be done until 29. Some of them are saying even 30. I'm saying that it all depends on the contractor. If you get, after watching so many contractors work, if you get a contractor that's big enough and has enough depth in the skill and talent and experience in his company or their company, um, you'll find that some of these timelines are condensed because they know how to make up time, they know how to be efficient and, um, you know, do some of the work simultaneously. And then each of the phases will be bid out separately. So I think it's going to be key as to whether the guy doing the first phase gets to phase two and three, which it would stand to reason that his mode would be reduced somewhat. So he would, but that remains to be seen. So, and you know, I'm sorry I'm babbling. I love this project. It's like the child I never had. Um, and I could talk about it all day. So I will stop and see if anybody has any questions. All right, thank you, Joy. And um, it's never easy being a straight science speaker or any public speaker. And <clears throat> this is a good time for the audience to, while you're thinking of your questions to throw a little um, love for Joy in the chat box oh. and uh, thank her for the thank her for taking the time to present so we do have a caller on the line and as you know in straight science callers get priority because it's you just you can't even jump up and down no one's going to see you so i'm going to open this to the caller first and if the caller has any questions go for it if not it's okay if you just remain silent but unmute and come on in if you do have a question about the port for joy. All right, so the caller, I, okay. So I see iPhone, go ahead iPhone with your hand raised. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, 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 okay, great, I'm iPhone. Um, oh, first of all, Joy, I mean, I know this has been a massive undertaking and, and really you've done a tremendous job and, and I do appreciate it. And, and I could probably go on with about eight questions, but. One at a time, I, Sue. Yeah, I know. So, but I think the one that, that concerns me the most, and it may not even be a question for the port people, it may be more for the city, but, you know, I guess I'm concerned Right now, we have no housing for people that want to move here. And that uh, we know from when Rock Creek went in that uh, we just know that everything will now increase in cost. And what I'm wondering is, is there going to be uh, a way that this, the economics of all of this trickle down to particularly to know, we, if you're a homeowner, if you're in like Flint, but to gnome service workers who are primarily 
renters who are already struggling to make it. Um, is, is there somebody paying attention to how this is going to affect basically the haves and the have nots in Nome? Not, and um, I'm not trying to say I'm opposed to it. I just want to know if somebody is looking at this because I think it's, um, it's quite foreseeable. Um, thanks, Sue. Yes, uh, appreciate the kudos. And I can tell you that the housing issue has been discussed, I couldn't tell you how many times throughout the entire design period. The housing issue is discussed at the city level, the port commission level, as well as uh, the federal level, the district with the core. Um, the intent is not to impact the local housing market. Um, the core is having, they have, they have revitalized this discussion so that they have the latest information. They're actually doing, I think, yeah, they, they completed, I think a few weeks ago, a housing market survey of Nome. Um, and, because the project materials are coming um, are coming together, you know they need to finalize the language that addresses this issue that they do happen to have in the specifications. So um, everyone is aware of the issue. It is being discussed, and I don't anticipate there to be. Um, you know, no one's going to, well, let me rethink that. Joy, uh, would this be nobody's going to, for no, going to, no one is ignoring the issue. Everyone is fully aware of the issue and trying to come, come to an agreement on the language so that they can decide you know, the best way to write it in the contract. And I can tell you contractors that I've, that I've run into, you know, we don't talk specifics, but I can tell you the contractors I've talked to in recent years are all talking about bringing in their own. No, nobody wants to get the bad stigma of coming in and trying to take up everyone's housing. So yes, it's a hot topic and no one is ignoring it. Um, one quick question is, uh, who would be, you know, if we were to, if I were to follow up more specifically on this particular topic, and it isn't just housing, but housing is obviously a big piece, would it be primarily the city? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, obviously, I, that's start with Glenn, doing. Glenn would call me. <laughs> so, I mean, yes, we would, we would discuss it together. That's helpful. Right. I was going to kind of go attack it the same way. Yeah, right and thank you very much for your question. And if you've got seven more, just um, keep them coming. <laughs> keep them Hold coming, on. but but we'll just go in order here. No, so there fine. is a comment. You. Oh, you bet. You bet. I'm glad you called in. So there is a comment section 8.8.2.2. I'm not sure what that refers to, uh, which document, but Oh, the feasibility of the feasibility study identifies potential significant housing impacts. Thank you, Austin. So that's it. That's in the feasibility study. So it sounds like yes. housing. Could you repeat yes. where that? Could you repeat where that is? You bet. It says this is from Austin Namasek, Section eight point eight point two point two of the feasibility study for the port identifies potential significant housing impacts. Okay, but doesn't necessarily address them, but yes, I realize no. it identifies. Them. Identifies, okay, yes. thank you. Thank you both. Yes. You bet. And thank you, Austin, for putting that down in there. It looks like that's gonna get some attention there. Um, all right, next we have Anna Rose McCarthy. Go ahead, Anna. Hi, thanks. This is kind of, also a wider city question is if there are hundreds of more people coming into town to develop this port project and the city's going to help provide space to develop a workers camp 
what is going to happen with the law enforcement? Is the law enforcement, the police department or troopers, are they expected to expand to accommodate extra population? Thanks. Yeah, that's, um, for well, for starters, hi, Anna. A Anna, um, this is, uh, for starters, the, the troopers, uh, that's a separate question. You'll have to ask them. Um, the, the city police, I think that, you know, in, in, in looking for what they expect to happen, um, you know, they would determine whether or not they would be adding staff. Um, we haven't had those conversations or I haven't been party to them, but I can tell you that, um, you know, we're, for those that have looked at the, uh, you know, at the project materials as they've been developed, you know, we're thinking of 80 to 100 people. We're not thinking of hundreds. We're looking at, I think, for construction, I think the contractor will be bringing in less than 100 people to build the project each ice free season. That may tick up just a little bit while they're finishing phase one and already starting phase two. So it'll either be two contractors bringing employees in or it'll be the same contractor bringing a few more in. Um, we're not gonna get inundated with hundreds of people all at once. Does that answer just, the question? Well, there's just not enough work for that. But yeah, as far as what the PD is doing, um, yeah, that's a good question for Glenn. I guess to I'll follow make a note up of on it. that then is with that that figure, I don't have it in front of me anymore, but I think it was something like over 800 jobs um, during the construction phase. So is that is that unique positions or is that over time? Um, I guess, how do I better understand that number? This is, um, I don't know when you joined, but when I was talking about this, this regional, this these are jobs that, you know, they translate into other industries. They don't necessarily have to be in Nome. Let me pull up that economic. But but um, how many of them are? Well, I, I, but how well, many of them are? I saw that your numbers were, you know, included regional, uh, included local, but didn't specify local. Included local. Well, you know, Sue, I, I can't tell you exactly how many the contractor is going to bring in for jobs. I can tell, I can, I can pull up the economic research that was provided, that was done to put, you know, and they do them in this type of language, regional, statewide, and national. Now we can go back and try to break that out into what the local is. And if I can do that, then I will put that in the chat. So, okay. so I guess, yeah, thank you both. I know that's a, one of the questions I was going to ask too is um, local hire seems to be a question that comes up. So I know that it's probably hard to come up with a exact number of jobs, but is there a way that of the however many workers are coming, is there going to be a push for local hire? Because that's a, are, kind of exciting there, to hear that there may be jobs in Nome for Nome there, for regional employees. There regional are, people. there has already been consistent discussion about local hire. Okay. Um, in, uh, in the federal jobs, I mean, I'm sorry, in federal construction work, there's always encouragement to hire local, especially in Alaska. I suspect they will, um, we'll be seeing just like in the previous large construction projects we had, there were local hires of the, if, if the talent pool that is needed can be met in Nome, then those people can apply for the work, especially the folks that are part of the union hall for the construction, you know, the union halls in Anchorage and Fairbanks, for the construction positions. All right. Does it's that make sense? 
it's important to note that local hire means um, within the state of Alaska, as, as I understand it. It doesn't mean local the way we think of local, correct? Well, I, so think, I think you're right, but it depends on who you're talking to as to whether they agree to that. <clears throat> but I think you're right. All right, thank you, Sue. Uh, Anna, did you get your question answered? I did, thank you. And and I have um, a couple more, but I, I want other people to be able to ask questions as well. All right, we'll, we'll come around. As long as Joy can take the questions, we'll keep them coming. I guess I even have some too. Um, and I've actually had one that was, actually I have two questions that were texted into me. So the first one is, as of today, what is GNOME's required financial contribution? Basically, what is the 10% that I wrote, I wrote down? What does the 10% kind of look like in dollars? I think I have that right. Do we know? And if it's, I don't know if it's for the whole project or if it's just for phase one, I, I don't know. Because like a rough, I think is what they're looking We're for. looking... We're looking in, in the range of uh, 30 to 50 million. Okay. Of, of the general navigation features, the match to the core. <clears throat> okay. And they had a second question. So I'm just going to go for this person um, wanting to be shy, I think. Will GNOME be looking to financing our portion via general obligation bonds or revenue bonds? At I can't help you with that because I'm not sure what that actually means, but that's the question. At this time, those options are in the back of our minds. At this time, we haven't progressed in that direction, but it remains on the table um, and could always become a strong option. We haven't, we haven't started down that road yet, but two years from now, we're looking at the funding for phase three. Um, either of those could be an option, yes. All right. Anyone else? I see. I know we can go back to Sue and Anna, and we will, but let's see if there's anyone else. The caller, do we still have our caller? We do. So I just want to check in because it's not easy to be a caller on a Zoom call, right? You can't raise your hand. You can't do much, but jump in. So whenever the caller wants to jump in, if you have any questions, go for it. Seeing none, I'm going to ask a question, then hand it off to Sue, who will hand it off to Anna, unless someone else jumps in. Oh, we've got a question in the chat quickly. So if not the GO, would that be general obligation bonds I'm uh -huh. looking or revenue bonds? What is the funding source? Property tax? Question mark. No, no. Sorry. I need to be frank, straight with that. Okay. That's good no. to know. Property, no, sorry, I got a no property tax or sales tax will fund this project. Right. Absolutely not. We have made that commitment. And I know the mayor and the council has said it numerous times. And yes. All right. You we guys see are going to come chasing me down if somebody gets elected and changes <laughs> that. But no. No, I, I think everyone understands that that's unrealistic. Put that on the backs of the taxpayers locally. And we now know what it is not. What might it be? Sorry. Hmm? The return for your, um, there's a return mm -hmm. chat, a response saying, okay, you know, thanks. We now know what it is right. not the, for raising the funds. We now know what the funds won't be. Right, no property tax, no sales tax, it sounds like. Do we know what it might be? Oh, well, does everybody remember 
um, that we received 175 million from the state of Alaska last June. Um, at the very end of the session, the very last amendment to the capital budget. No? I do, but but others may not if they're yeah, just tuning well, in for the first well, time. I'm, I'm gonna put it in here so that everybody can see it. Once that's in, I do have a related question, but yep. I can wait my turn too. No, you're you're next. I, I I do have a quick one, but it's okay. You're on the docket next. I can't hog, hog them all, so we'll. I can take no, a turn. No, no, no. It's just it was related to this question. That's the only reason ah. I brought it up. Okay, well, why don't you ask it? While uh, at least we'll we'll have time to think about it while Joy's uh, go for it. Whatever she's gonna do. Well, go and it, I mean, this question was related to the construction of of the port. My question is. The cost of once this thing is in and the cost of port operations, which will be managed, you, you, there were the three parts explained and that there's the part that the city is handling, uh, you know, everything on the roads and, and that NJUS with the increase in, you know, electrical needs and services. How does that get covered? Will we be seeing, you know, will, will, will residents see that as an increase in, in their payments or uh, does the city have some other plan for how to fund the increased operations once the port's completed? The operation costs. The increased operations of the port are intended to be funded by the users, not, I mean, like we're not gonna tag the local electric bills to make up for the electrical investment we made in the port, right? Okay, well, that's that's good. So the, 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 it's anticipated that the users of the port will then provide enough revenue to cover those expenses. Well, yeah, that's kind of where we are now. We're, okay. Yeah, we the city doesn't subsidize the port. Um, well, it's complicated because the city pays <laughs> our bills and we reimburse them because we don't we don't stand separately from the city. Anyway, long story. Um, but we receive our own revenue and we have to manage operations within that revenue and we do and if we need funds for construction or design or repair then we we either draw it out of savings get it from the city and reimburse or we look for a grant or you know so no we're not the property taxes sales tax electrical costs, all those things that the local folks bear for their life in Nome, those will not be increased to fund port operations. Now, Thank you. I'm, yeah, you're welcome. And I'm not saying, I can't tell you that, you know, utilities isn't going to decide that they're paying so much more for fuel, they don't need to jack the rate, but it's not about the port. Okay, I understand. Good, thank you. You're All right, thank you both. Anna, are your hands still up? And I know you said you had a, a, another question or two. So. <clears throat> Unless anyone else wants yeah. to jump in, you're in. You're up. Thank you. So this summer, there's 19 cruise ships. Six of those are research cruises, and they're all scheduled um, to arrive on different days, except for. One day, July 30th, there's a cruise ship and a research cruise scheduled. So once it, once the port is fully expanded, how many cruise ships would be able to come into port at one time? Thanks. You got um, Well, <clears throat> there are a lot of variables to answering that question. It would depend on the other traffic scheduled for the days that 
the ships were calling for. Um, it would be based on shoreside capacity to handle the ships. Um, the, you know, we've got the local tour company that is able to rent the buses and manage the passenger flow, the luggage flow, uh, bring, then they bring the stores, uh, local construction companies bring the stores out with you from the airport and that's, that's the resupply of the ship. Um, or from the local grocery store, if that's where they've ordered them. Um, if we still only have one ground tour company and they can handle two ships, we would allow two ships to come in. And, you know, there's always the, op the option that we would allow two ships to more if they needed to get people off to an airport, but that they would rent, the majority of them would remain on board or be just released into town until the tour company could handle them through their operations. So as you can see, there, there are a lot of different variables. Um, we're not gonna have, I think, three large cruise ships at once. We still have primarily the adventure cruises, but the ships are getting a little bigger that come up and those companies are building ice strengthened hulls. So that would tell you they intend to um, come to the Arctic. Um, yeah, I no. think that will fare, fare it, that will work itself out as we get closer to determining when this deep water basin can be used, which will probably be 26 for shallow, anything that's not requiring the 40 feet and 27 for those that do. And, you know, we're not, we're, we're not gonna overload town if we can help it. We would, we so would try to stagger the traffic. Go ahead. So Joy, for, for reference, cause the picture you have right up on the screen right now, it might be helpful for people to understand what is the, that cruise ship, it wasn't that a, um, is that the Crystal Serenity that was used as sort of a, a mock-up for this? A model ship, yes. Okay, so if that helps, Anna, that cruise ship, that big one right there, how many people did that have on it, Joy? Thousand. Thousand. Okay, and Joy's put something in the link here, or in the chat box, a link to... To economics. Okay. From the feasibility study. Okay. Does that help? Um, Anna, about that size of the ship, and then you can kind of figure maybe how that would, I don't know, that, that's what a thousand passenger ship looks like to the scale of the port. Yeah, I guess just to maybe help me understand a little more, what, what's the what's the possible capacity? There's all these variables about, uh, Joy, like you were saying, scheduling and staffing, but I guess like how many could possibly be in port at once? How many ships or how many people? How many cruise ships? Physically, if we were to just have all cruise ships in port, physically we could get three or four in. I just don't see that happening. Because we, we rarely have a day where we have no other traffic, but we would have four ships on that day. It's, it's, it's a little, little far-fetched in my mind. Uh, you know, it makes more sense that we would have other traffic and we'd have cruise traffic on one dock. Even if a smaller cruise was in and they were in on the uh, east side, the new east causeway, and we had the bigger ship out at the the deep water basin. Um, yeah, I just, I just don't see it as being practical, Anna. I mean, so we could have two, sh we have had two ships in at once, one at the dock, and want it anchor, uh, usually because they needed the same dock. Occasionally it can be because they're drawing just a bit too much water and they don't want to go in. But we've had two ships in Nome at the same time. All right. Does that get you an answer, Anna? Yes, thank you. All right. Um, I see Megan Gannon has her hand up. 
Go ahead, Megan. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, Joy. I was just wondering, and I don't see this in the feasibility study, um, if you could elaborate on how a deep report would actually help with search and rescue operations or um, oil spill response and, and things like that, or I don't know if you could explain a little bit more what that would actually look like and how a deep report would help. Yeah, probably work better if I turn off the mute button. Um, when we're we're talking about positioning of a Coast Guard cutter, fast response cutter, we've been in discussions with the Coast Guard for the last, oh geez, I don't know, 15 years, Denise, at least. Um, So the, and and I can tell you after just getting back from DC last week that they have you know we've been lobbying them to put a seasonal forward operating location in Nome so that they could um, you know work out of Nome on a marine operation but they just can't find the right equipment and the, the assets the marine assets for a vessel and what to do with that in the winter time. But after our last trip, things have really turned around and they're actually looking at perhaps uh, evaluating the purpose of um, and the costs and the reality of putting a ship in Nome seasonally based on, you know, they've got the air, the helo ops in Kotzebue. Um, so, you know, having a ship that just worked out of Nome, like the size of the ship that's coming in here on the stern of the cruise ship, you know, something that is not huge that they couldn't justify positioning in Nome. Those are the types of search and rescue assets that we're talking about. We're not talking about local, you know, we've got a great volunteer fire department, search and rescue and ambulance. Um, we're not talking about how this is going to support our local departments. It's talking about being able to sustain and support and supply Coast Guard search and rescue assets. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so is, um, I forgot what I was going to say. So so a ship that might be here, um, I don't know, either temporarily, I guess not permanently, but uh, on a temporary basis, do you have an idea of, I don't know, how, how many um, people a ship like that would support or I don't know how many new people that might bring in? We haven't even started talking about the size of the vessel or, you know, which, which, uh, which vessel would serve the, the need the best, fit the need and serve the purpose. So uh, it's early in them actually reciprocating on our, on our talks for once. So I couldn't tell you, um, you know, a number, I don't know, 50, 60 guys on maybe a, let me think, 60 footer. And no, 110, that's right. We were looking at the 110 foot vessels, um, but we have no idea what they're going to evaluate for putting in Nome. And, and of course they would spend most of their time out on the water. They wouldn't be just sitting at the dock. That's not, that's not what they do. They're meant to be on the water. They could alternate as a, uh, a law, law enforcement vessel as well out on the dateline. So there's there's a lot of variables in that situation too. It would depend on what the Coast Guard felt was the best use for that vessel in the Bering Strait while being supported recruit and uh, resupplied out of Nome. Thanks. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Joy. There is a comment in the chat. I read Bering Street Native Corporation commented the existing Cape 
Cape Nome rock had less than 100 years of rock, maybe 30, question mark. Now you exclaim the Cape has 100 years of material. I think that's just a comment. There doesn't seem yeah. to be a question right there. Well, I can, I can just give one comment on that. Um, okay. The 100 years point that I shared was given to me by a Bering Straits, a VSNC uh, management employee. So, you know, a management employee, one of the managers. So I tend to put uh, some stock in it. All right. Um, and we have iPhone. Is that you, Sue? Again? Yep, it is. I'm going to, I'm going to, Go go give it to Charlie and we'll circle back. That's fine. Okay. I'm here, but I and I'll and I'll keep waiting. All right. I might squeak I might squeak a question in too. Go ahead, well, Charlie. Yeah, and you should. All right. Go ahead, Charlie. You're up at bat. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, one of the one of the Arctic uh, shipping rules that's been put in place, and Joy mentioned it already, that you know, there's there's a bunch of rules. You're about how to handle waste how to handle uh, American flag vessels versus uh, foreign flag vessels and all these things. And, and, uh, and, uh, and also what's not been mentioned is all the traffic on the other side of the date line with the Chinese slash Russian fuel, uh, fuel lift. And they're, they're projecting 75 ice hardened or almost icebreaker sorts of LNG and bulk fuel carriers. Um, and that, that ramp up of that fleet's already begun. So one of, the, one of the things to enforce the rules about fishing, about pollution, and about just general maritime traffic is that there, the US needs to have a place to uh, to launch from or to, to resupply from. And currently that place is Dutch Harbor. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's very important that the known port be available, even if it isn't staffed with a dedicated staff, but it, it will become a very important place if there is an oil spill, if there is a shipwreck and those things have happened uh, just a couple years ago, lifeboat, a lifeboat washed up on St. Lawrence Island with no explanation. Apparently a, a fishing processing vessel went down and we still don't know how bad that accident was, but their lifeboat washed up on the beach. That's a, that's a pretty serious thing. And it could ease, now we have trawlers oh. working in the Chuck GC. So it, it's a very real likelihood. If you have a hundred cargo vessels having an accident, it's a real likelihood. So it, it's important. It's a real thing. And, and to, to enforce and to uh, realistically make laws about, about that use, you gotta have, you gotta have a place, a port that can serve the vessels that, that need to be served and you, and you need to have some enforcement teeth. And, no, and the no. second, the second point I wanted to make was that I'm, I'm very grateful to Joy, and I think the city of Nome should be. She's been a, an advocate for the city of Nome for decades, and she's about to retire, and it's a, uh, we're really going to miss her. So uh, I think the, that her leadership, her advocacy for the port and to see that the port was built properly and, and the existing facilities that we have are all in large part to her efforts. She's the one that coordinated the, the lobbyists. She's the one that badgered the Corps of Engineers and, and they need it. <laughs> she's, a, she's a good manager and, uh, and she's a good accountant. And uh, anyway, I, uh, Charlie, you're killing me, but thank yeah. you. I don't yeah. know. I need so, to crawl under the desk. Well, so anyway, um, she's, 
She she worked on behalf of the city of Nome, and certainly she gets a a lot of res respect for this and responsibility for for getting the port going. But uh, it was a team effort, and she's been the lead for a long time. But she's been working with with a lot of people in the city, and I I think people need to respect that. So thank you. Thank you, Charlie. And I just would add that in it was um, 2012 when the Capitan Bolsonovsky went down and the lifeboat of that vessel did go to St. Lawrence Island, but more, um, maybe more real world was that we, for the next three years, had heavily oiled seals and seabirds that were harvested for subsistence. And uh, we had to have a response and that led that ship that let go 40 miles north east of Cape Navarin in the southern Gulf of Anadir. Um, we don't know how much fuel it had enough to have 200,000 gallons on board. How much it actually had on board, we don't know. But for the next three years, we did have oiled seals and seabirds that were um, not from our side. I mean, the Coast Guard did a response and it led to actually the first um, incident command stand up for the Arctic for oiling. So in the U.S. Arctic. So anyway, thank you for bringing that up, Charlie. The oiling. That did have an impact. Some of these big vessels, we have that threat here today, <laughs> obviously. Um, all right. I did get another text um, from the money-minded money minded person. And they had a follow-up. And that was for the 10% of the project costs that Nome will cover, not using sales tax, not using property tax, um, will the 150 million that come from the state cover that 10% obligation of Nome? I think is how I read this. Yes. Okay. It's 175, just to be okay. clear. All right. Great, thank you very much on behalf of that person. Um, and here's a question from me, quick. The, I have had a lot of questions from different research vessels and so forth. What will happen during the phase one construction of the West Jetty? Where do people dock? Will we still be able to, whatever year this is gonna be, maybe ostensibly next summer, is it is the port will the port be open for business for yes. like overnight guests and stuff you know these research vessels and whoever else needs to use the port port operations will continue we have to during construction there's nowhere yeah. to push them to okay we have to accommodate them and um we will work hand in hand with the contractor as in previous years but this will be the most congested tetris puzzle yet but we'll still make it work Let's we'll for... give way and then they'll give way and we'll have to in order to get the operations and the construction done. All right. It's going to be teamwork there. Yep. All right. Thank you, Joy. And thank you for fielding all these questions. Um, sure. You say you can talk about the port all night. We might. And that's OK. Looks <laughs> like we still have a good line of questions. So iPhone and then Anna. All right, not hearing from iPhone. Oh, we'll go. Sorry, oh. I'm back. Oh, okay. I forgot to unmute. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. And I guess I'm iPhone. First of all, Joy, thanks to Charlie. If there, if this thing goes belly up or uh, people don't like it, they'll, they're certainly going to know who to blame. So I think it's great you're retiring. This is a wise move. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't tell us where you're going. <laughs> no. No, that's not why I'm retiring, but I I, I take your, <laughs> your point. Thanks for the laugh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, now, and now for the question. Um, the one thing you brought up that really concerned me is this dealing with these waste products uh, and choosing to be the site that does this to incinerate hazardous materials. And, and we don't know quite what coming off of, of different flagged vessels. Frankly, I'd, I'd rather we let Dutch Harbor have that, but they don't do it either. Are, what pardon? They don't do it either because they don't the have a way to get it off the island. 
But ahead. what are the potential, uh, depending on how this is dealt with, I mean, what are the potential health hazards for people living in Nome if this stuff is being incinerated? Um, actually, you know, they have a, an entire department with the U.S. Uh, DA and the U.S. Coast Guard that handles these animal plants and uh, food wastes from foreign galleys. Um, there are restrict, there are strict handling procedures, processing, packaging. They get put into big plastic totes coming off the ship. They get sealed. They get taken to the incinerator building, which would be out at the landfill, and they would be um, handled by an under strict guidance and guideline. I mean, you screw up, you lose your permit from the Coast Guard and you don't get to do it at all. So you don't wanna get an investment of that dollar value and then not be able to handle the materials properly. Everybody has to go through training. And then when it's incinerated, there are um, you know, proper filters in place and work for the exhaust and that's getting out of my territory but I can tell you that the they have to the, the government has to approve the incinerator you're you're requesting and then inspect it before you're able to use it so you know it's not like like it's going to be just uh, haphazardly handled Sue it's going to be uh, for all of the state and federal stipulations that are in place. And the idea is to keep all this stuff out of the ocean. If well, we I take the waste then they then and they have a place to discharge it in the Arctic, then there's a less likely chance they will put it in the ocean because they want to get rid of it. So they're more than happy to pay to get rid of it. But, but didn't you mention that some of this may be hazardous materials? No, no, it's, it's well, so they I think call it regulated waste because it comes out of the galley where they cook food on the foreign ships. And that's it. That's it. Yeah, I think there's a, like, a, again, not my bailiwick, but I believe, Sue, if it helps, there's like EPA standard. You, you can't just, you know, take a chuck a bunch of stuff in an incinerator and light it off. It's not like those no. those kind of days. I think it has we to be EPA uh, well, qualified. Well, unfortunately, until we can ship hazardous materials out of Nome, that's still kind of the situation. We, we really I, don't. I think hazardous, what are you talking? Are you talking something that is controlled? Like a control? No, like I mean, even or oil paint, you know, even oil paint is considered a hazardous material okay. or somebody whatever but i i don't want to belabor the point i'm i'm glad yeah. that, that this is it's not accepting hazardous material but i do hope that it goes through a, a public review so that the public is buying into whatever it is we're we're taking on to dispose of and feels good about it that'll probably be like an i would imagine like joe i think there's a probably like an in city of gnome i can see after this we need to have Glenn Steckman come and do a straight science for all these other good, <laughs> they're good questions. I don't know if it's not built yet. I don't know. And Joy's moving, but you bring up really good points too. I'm not, I'm not saying you're not, it's just, we need, maybe the answer would come, will come. Sure. No, thank you, Gay and, and Joy. <laughs> so there's a, there's a question that relates to, to Sue's question. And that is, Deanna Hacker is asking, so the incinerator, would it be at the, Beam Road landfill, a landfill on the Beam Road. If so, how is the transport of the materials handled? Handled, sort of maybe a, a sim, similar to what we just heard. Oh, there we go. Joy answered the material. Wow, you're quick on the chat. The materials are placed into sealed totes and hauled in a truck. All right, to the landfill on the Beam Road. So the public like city flatbed or a dump truck or depends on the quantity. But right. that is, uh, that's regulated as well. I mean, everything that you do after you take it from the ship is regulated by the government. Even now you clean the incinerator. <clears throat> Deanna, I hope that gets you the answer you're looking for or need. 
I just want to add, add that regulated if, if you if you need to put something else in. Uh, go ahead, iPhone, and then it's Anna's patiently been waiting. Oh, okay, J just that regulated doesn't mean enforced, but that's okay. Uh, carry well, on. We'd have to enforce it, Sue, if we want to be a world class port. I hope so. But you well, need the federal the idea. Ladies, I'm going to break in and say thank you very much, Sue. Um, and okay. Hand it over to no nothing, but we're we're just kind of bantering, and I'm I'm trying to get the questions because we don't want to keep everyone. All right, Deanna says yes. Anna, you're up. Go ahead. Thanks. I'm I'm really appreciating all these questions, and I want to just circle back to um, Megan Gannon's question about, and I I I there was a response to it, but I I guess I just did not fully absorb it but about the oil spill response um when i talk with people about shipping concerns the number one concern is response capability to an oil spill so the port will bring more traffic to nome it brings traffic closer to shore increasing the risk of oil spills so um is there going to be more infrastructure staged in Nome as the port expands and more ships are coming in and not not just staged but actually able to be deployed quickly thanks well yes Anna, thanks for that um there have there are several oil spill response companies they call them um osros that have equipment staged to Nome, or they have, and they have um, uh, signed agreements with some of the vessel operators that home port in Nome that to, to become like vessels of opportunity. Um, <clears throat> um, and there are, you know, just even, even with like a vessel that's, um, out of commission at a vessel offshore that may be leaking oil and their engines are out. And, you know, we've got a tow system that the Coast Guard has, leaves in Nome for one of those types of emergency responses. So yes, as the traffic continues to increase, we are talking about, you know, we are already getting calls from tugboat companies that are looking to, that want to know, you know, when the construction will be complete or when the west side will be done. They're interested in wanting to be, make themselves available for salvage towing, for oil spill response, for deploying materials that would be onshore in containers out to respond to a spill. Now, clearly the size of, <laughs> The Bering Sea and the Arctic waters, I mean, it, it's going to take, you know, our growth is going to have to reach the level that we've got sufficient vessels around or larger vessels of opportunity, tugs tied to a barge that can be requested to deploy search and um, um, oil spill uh, equipment to respond to a spill. So, Yes, the talks are happening. Yes, we have vessel companies reaching out to us, asking questions. Um, and as the traffic grows, the folks that we that already have assets in Nome, including DEC, will um, will be expanding on those quantities because they essentially have to. Now, one of the problems probably going to get myself in trouble here, but I'm leaving soon, so I'll go ahead and say it. Um, one of the problems is the state of Alaska has allowed a lot of the um, oil spill plans for the barges and the ships to be satisfied, the requirements to be satisfied by spill response companies under contract that then have to get on an airplane and be transshipped to wherever the spill is or the closest facility. So we've got 
we're told, you know, we've got several companies that are transiting the region and they can get a spill response company mobilized and onto an airplane with a HERC bringing all their gear 24 hours. <clears throat> we think that, you know, at least I, I'll, I'll say this, outside of the city, I think that these vessels should be responsive to the degree that they are the immediate response and have enough equipment and material on board to do the initial response without having their spill response plan rely on a contractor that's in the city. But that's my two cents. I don't want to keep bantering that. All right. <clears throat> Did that answer the question from the from the person who asked? Thank you. Yes. Okay, Anna. Thanks. Um, there is a comment in the chat from Austin Mossack. There are numerous waste streams from ships that pose potential health impacts that are not enforced. And the link takes you to a paper that actually um, is pertaining to the Bering Strait. And it looks like Austin is a co-author. So very interesting. And what is frustrating is that ships can obtain waivers on how waste is regulated. All the while, the federal government is reluctant to enforce environmental regulations. Question, to Austin, is that at the IMO level or is that our state DEC? Where, if we wanted to like say something about that, who do you, is it IMO or state Coast Guard? The, the IMO is a very cumbersome body. Um, DEC regulates a lot of this, but you know the really frustrating thing is that you can report these violations and I have. I've been on these ships and I've reported the violations DEC and EPA and our own federal government, they, because of our remoteness, they won't enforce these regulations, even when you give them evidence of a violation, whether it's a vessel stack emission, uh, a oily waste stream, or one of the 40, 40, there are up to 40 waste streams that come from ships. They're, they're a mobile city. So every kind of waste that you think a, a, a town generates, these ships generate. And um, it is extremely difficult to get enforcement to handle these handle these discharges, illegal discharges. Just take, for instance, our marine debris event. All of that plastic was totally illegal. Yeah. No, no one got in trouble. And for, for people who are unaware, that was the foreign marine debris event of 2020, where the Bering Strait region was a bit of a wash with Russian and Korean <laughs> uh, marine debris, likely from the Gulf of Anadir or from the increased commercial fishing activity that now that our ecosystem is under uh, transition, um, those ships are moving north. And in 2020, we had an event so uh, of some notoriety. So I, I guess I can I ask a, I'll, I'll ask a question to that. So if we, Joy, if the, it sounds like that is, that is a problem, would, would by any way having more Coast Guard in town, would they be then, could we ask them, you know, you guys got to go get that. You got to, you know, if we see something like that, like a, a um, environmental regulations, if they're, if they're here, would they be, I mean, I don't know, you talk to them more, would they be more likely to go after and enforce environmental misdoings? It depends on if it's under their, point? it depends on if it's under their umbrella. I mean, they're not going to go enforce things for EPA. They might report it and they may be asked to go investigate it just because of the remoteness. But um, yeah, I mean, if, if they're around, you'd certainly make them aware of it and then they will do their due diligence to check it out. If there's, if the agency who's responsible for it is nowhere in, proximity, even distant proximity. <clears throat> All right. Well, I encourage people to look at that paper that I'm going to be doing that. Thank you very much, Austin, for your words and that link. Sounds really interesting. All right. Well, Joy's still hanging in there. We hit the eight o'clock mark. iPhone has still got her hand raised. You got one less. And our caller has never, never spoken up, but maybe they will when it's all over. Uh, iPhone, go ahead. If you've got no, one. No, no, no. I, 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 you know, I could go on forever, but no, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, All I right. just didn't realize my hand was still up. 
Oh, oh, okay. It's a Zoom thing. No worries. No kidding. Okay, I'm too old for this. Thank you. No, no, you're doing great. All right, and then there is a question in the chat. On national security, what do you know of the Navy's plans to use the Port of Nome? Hmm. Is that classified? No, I'm just trying to okay. think about how to phrase it. <clears throat> okay, once I'm just going to put it in the chat, but I can say it once the deep water basin is in place and accurately dredged. Uh, adequately, adequately dredged. The Navy vessels that can utilize a minus, minus 40 foot For mean lower, lower water depth will use the port of Nome for fuel and resupply. Okay, so if I can paraphrase that, I I'm guess gonna, I, yeah, yes, I'm, and for I'm gonna hit go here. All right. Um, Sounds like the Navy has plans if the port is available to them at the correct mm -hmm. depth, yep. something like that, then they will come and resupply and refuel. Is that right? More than likely. I'm not More than likely. Like a guarantee okay. on anything. Well, who knows about anything anymore, but um, at least that's, yeah, right. that is a, that's a good answer for us to hear, certainly, to put in our minds and think about. Well, yeah, I mean, it makes sense that, I mean, why would they go all the way back to Dutch to resupply and refuel if they could do it in Nome? Well, and you and, mentioned a and submarine. shorten their mission. Yeah. I don't know anyone who owns a submarine other than the Navy, but. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there it is in the chat. Once the deep water basin is in place and adequately dredged, the Navy vessels that can utilize a minus 40 uh, mean low low water depth will quote more than likely use the port of Nome for refueling and resupply. Good question, and thank you for bringing that up, Deanna. Uh, always good to be thinking mindful nowadays of uh, things like that. So thank you for that. All right, really interesting questions, Joy. You 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 took them all, and um, Charlie, thanks for the shout out for for the city of Nome and Joy. She has a long career in Nome, and I'm um. I I, I honestly I know you've got to uh, you've got to you know you've got your retirement plans, but right right when we're building the port, I, I'm, I'm hey, you know we've been climbing the hill. There you go. To get it, and we got it. So you guys okay. got this. You can put your yeah. your feet up. All right. Well, thanks. That. And for all of those still on next week is Iditarod. And we are going to have a straight science on Tuesday, the 14th. It's going to be Iditar Iditarod Madness. And this will be local Northwest Campus UAF uh, students. Bonnie Davis, Sheil, and Doug Sheil are going to be talking about the high range latitude management program. They're also going to be talking about their trip uh, over to Scandinavia to look at how they do their reindeer business and whatnot over there and what what's what's going to potentially be be available for us in the future kind of looking at a comparative and with our long history of reindeer it's very interesting and of course the UAF Northwest Campus High Latitude Range Management Program going to be fun to hear from two students that are very very involved as well as uh, locally involved with the Midnight Sun Ranch. All right. Other than that, thank you all again, and hopefully we'll see you Tuesday for the Reindeer Talk. Joy, thanks again, and the City of Nome, we're going to try to get Glenn Steckman. You can tell him I'm coming to, ah, to okay. let, him, 
Yeah, to let him know. If you want to stay on for a second, that'd be great. And I know the caller wanted to maybe say hi. With that, everyone, thank you so much and have a good night.